Welcome to Climate Academia, the series of um, online talks. This is an independent education initiative that aims to better explain the idea of interconnection and the importance of global collaboration for climate change. Today's guest is Dr. Shane Tchaikovsky. Good morning, Shane. Morning, Nisa. Morning, thanks for joining us. Let me tell you about Shane. Shane is an analyst with uh, years of experience spanning energy, state failure, and intervent intervention practices, in addition to acting as managing editor for Global Affairs Media Network called Diplomatic Courier. Shane also served um, on senior leadership team of young professionals in foreign policy. He holds a PhD from Oxford Brookes University, where he wrote on the intersection of history, sovereign identity, and intervention in Afghanistan. Shane, I have three questions for you mm -hmm. um, prepared today. One is on, on the issues related to the Paris Agreement and the fact that President Biden will host a leaders' climate summit on, um, on the Earth Day. Um, then there is also a question about national security, um, and the, the third question will be around the energy sector. But let me go straight away to the first question, which is related to Paris Agreement. So um, actually, the, the, the climate summit called by President Biden will be held on the 22nd of April, which is, by the way, the fifth anniversary of the opening for signature of the Paris Agreement agreement on climate change. So the UN negotiators often talk about the issue of trust and the role of the US at the international climate regime. And I'm, I'm wondering what's your view on the role of the Biden administration in the rebuilding of this lost trust? Shane, over to you. Sure. Well, obviously there's there's been a a sense of an erosion of trust over the last several years, but uh, it, but before before I go on to that, you know, th thanks again for having me here. I'm excited to talk to you as always. It's it's always nice to have a discussion with you. Um, <clears throat> sure. So the administration, they, they're very clearly signaling an, an intent to to sort of retake this leadership mantle or the idea of a leadership mantle, whether that's more generally globally or whether that's very specific to climate change, who knows, maybe climate change is definitely part of that. Um, we, we could talk about special climate envoy, John Kerry. Uh, he was just in China and South Korea, um, seeking to raise their climate, amb climate ambitions. Um, you, you did sort of get a non-binding agreement or at least statement between China and the US to work together on lowering emissions. Um, you know, th that might be something. It's not binding, but it's something. You, you don't expect anything binding coming out of this stuff. Uh, the administration has also been looking to initiate dialogues for the past couple of months with traditional allies, again, on adopting more ambitious climate targets, right? Um, and th this kind of turn has been met with maybe relief, certainly welcoming uh, by, the, by our allies, our traditional allies, maybe felt a little bit alienated. Uh, during the last administration. Uh, but for the time being, that, that feels more like they're being polite than it does as if anybody's persuaded. Um, so where are we right now? Obviously, we're still in prove it mode. Um, and I guess we just have to see where things are going. Uh, on a more symbolic level, um, Kerry has gone out of his way. Actually, he apologized on behalf of the US uh, for the sort of go it alone approach that we had taken on climate in the past several years. Um, it, it's a kind of symbolic ownership of our actions, um, of our institutions and so on that may be reassuring, but again, it's symbolic. I mean, we'll, we'll see what the Earth Day Virtual Summit um, that, that you mentioned, we'll, we'll see during that, the extent to which other governments are kind of taking this intended return to climate leadership seriously. There's been some indications that they might be um, but will it be purely symbolic or, or will there be something more tangible? Uh, we don't know. Uh, the, the carry visits have been intended to build momentum. Uh, but for the moment, I'd say that the results look mixed on that sense. Um, 
I, yes, I, let I, me let me just maybe um, pause on this because um, um, I've heard some comments and commentators saying uh, people from the climate change regime discussion crowd. I would say they talk about the um, the importance of this summit because it's sort of a um, milestone towards the COP26, which is uh, mm -hmm. a UN climate summit uh, mm -hmm. that uh, takes place on a regular basis annually. Last year it was postponed because of the pandemic. And um, so, again, going back to the lost trust by the former administration, now it's just this great opportunity for the US to rebuild the trust lost. And I don't know mm -hmm. if you are familiar with the first podcast of Climate Academia. Actually, we had this great honor hosting um, a representative of, um, of Bangladesh, uh, Professor Salim Hook, who actually commented on this lost trust. And he said that mm -hmm. he supports and welcomes the US, but he says there is so much that the US has to um, catch up with. And um, what do you think about that point? Sure. Um, I mean, I guess it depends on what you mean, mean by catch up with. Um, in terms of setting targets, uh, yeah, I guess. Uh, the Biden administration is set to a, a announce what the U.S. targets will look, by, look like uh, this week before the, before the summit. Um, we know that there will be some sort of emissions reductions goal for 2030. Uh, we already know that the Biden administration would like us to be carbon neutral by 2050. Uh, these targets are pretty in line with what some of the more ambitious other governments have, have called for. Um, we also know that there is going to be a promise of billions of dollars in aid for developing countries to help them tackle climate change, which is probably what I think is the most impressive or significant. Uh, but, okay, so, so in a sense, like, these are targets that are non-binding. They kind of mean what they mean in, when we start to carry it out. What we've seen with other governments, say, for instance, the UK, who's been touted as a major climate leader, the host of the COP26 and everything like that, there's a lot of controversy over, over their plan. Um, they have these really ambitious targets, but then the actual policies that they're carrying out. Uh, right now, it makes it look like it's a little bit of hot water or, or a little bit of hot air. Um, so I would say that we all have a lot of catching up to do. Uh, where, what the US needs to do very specifically that maybe other countries don't have as much of an obligation to do at this point is prove that the last four years are the past. Um, and that we can be looked to as a partner um, that, that who's really reliable. And there are there are, there are some things that we could do concretely to try to increase that trust, uh, which I could talk about a little bit as well right here, if you would like. Um, yeah, um, that's really interesting. And I think the role of, of the US on the international level, it's it's key in, in, mm -hmm. in actually also bringing um, back the trust in multilateral agreement. Sure. So the, that is a fair point and the, the role of the US is crucial. Let us move to national level. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I'd like to ask you about the issues related to national uh, security and climate change. So I've read this um, interesting article uh, where it was written that the Department of Defense um, Secretary Lloyd Austin announced um, incorporating climate risk analysis into modeling, um, the simulation, wargaming analysis, and the next national defense strategy. Is climate change now a national security priority for the Pentagon, do you think? Uh, so two things. One, it depends on what you mean by priority. And two, I would quibble a little bit with the idea of now. Um, the Department of Defense has actually thought about climate change as a national security issue for a long time. Um, it's almost as though what this announcement now is 
almost similar to Carrie apologizing. It's it's almost like saying we recognize that kind of some things went differently than we would have liked during the last couple of years. Uh, and, and now we're going to return to a certain way of approaching the climate change issue. So even under the Trump administration, the Department of Defense, the Pentagon, were treating it like a national security issue. It was largely about how they localized this that was different. But our national security strategies in the past also did include the kind of concerns that you would have with climate change, right? Uh, in terms of resource scarcity, uh, in terms of climate refugees, in terms of growing stress on state governments that are already weak, who are sort of in zones where you, where you can uh, expect a lot of additional pressures from climate change, right? Uh, whether those are economic or weather related or, or what have you. So in that sense, it's, it feels to me like we don't know that this actually changes However, th there is an implication, I think, um, that, okay, th th that there is something that changes, right? I, I, on the one hand, it's a resolution to sort of undo this persona non grata nature of, of how we looked at climate change under the Trump administration. Um, and on the other hand, it could be a resolution uh, to more closely tie in climate change not only more visibly as a consideration, but more essentially, right? So um, they talked about sort of looking at or, or tying it into sort of simulations and analyses more closely. That there were plenty of research reports by the DOD and other national security uh, apparatus within the US government uh, since 2008 uh, that, that have discussed these things, as well as within the, the defense industry. Actually, 2019 is when you saw the biggest surge in US government publications on climate change, right? They may have been sort of, again, verbalized in certain ways, but sure. So, so it's, it's definitely been something that we've been looking at. Um, <clears throat> how, how, how essentially it's actually going to play a role in war gaming scenarios. Um, I don't know that it has played a very central role in the past. It should. But, but again, I think that the Department of Defense has been saying that it should for a while, um, and, or, or at least the Pentagon specific. Uh, it, I know that there's been a lot of anxiety within the Pentagon that the military is not ready with the challenges created by climate change. So what this could be, and hopefully is, is a sort of recognition from our sort of more political apparatus that this is a valid concern by you know national security professionals that they needs to be taken seriously. Right. So is it a new communication, would you say? Is this emphasizing certain things, but actually building mm -hmm. on what has been achieved in the past mm -hmm. and presenting it is as a key result of many years of and many people um, contribution, would you say it is an issue of communicating things in a new mm. way? Um, so in 2015, the Obama administration actually was making a lot of noise about the importance of climate change in our national security strategy. So it, it really feels like I mean, it, it, it would be easy to, to just say that, that this is a return to that. It's like, well, let's erase the last four years. Let's, let's look at kind of where we were before the Trump administration and then, then, then move forward from there. But I don't think that that's, it's tempting, but I don't think it's fair because I, I think that you had a lot of national security professionals who are still moving forward. Um, so, so yes, you're right. I think that this is an evolution rather than a reset or a revolution. And sure, I mean, again, we're, we're not going to know, you and I aren't going to know what the actual changes are, right? 
uh, in terms of, I mean, unless unless we decide to just go and read a bunch of army code books. Right. Yeah. Hey, Shane, let me let me move to the third question. Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. um, and thank you for sharing um, your comments on the national security and climate change related issues. I appreciate that. Um, energy sector. The United States has about 94 traditional reactors out of the actually 440 worldwide, but um, rising costs have forced many power plants to shut um, with five more expected to close this year in Illinois and New York. And I wonder, um, you know, there is a debate on nuclear power mm -hmm. and nuclear power faces competition from electricity stations that burn cheap paint for um, natural gas and um, from renewable power, including wind and solar. Um, I'm interested actually uh, in a very specific issue related to energy so sector in the US. Uh, let me put the question right now. What is the level of, um, of public debate in America on the issue of nuclear power? Um, low, for the most part. It's not, the, there's not as much of a, of a debate on the role of nuclear energy as you would expect. Um, for the most part, the public seems to see it as old news and settled. Uh, and they're not super wrong on that. Um, there hasn't been a lot of technological advancement in our nuclear power sector for quite a while. Uh, up until 2013, we hadn't built a new reactor in 30 years, right? We, which is why right now you have a lot more going out of um, out of service th than are being developed. Re right now, there's two under development. Uh, you, you mentioned that five went out of commission last year. Um, yeah, and th this is not a trend that seems likely to shift anytime soon, uh, partly because it takes a long time to develop these things. They're very costly development times and costs often overrun. Um, but there is some debate, uh, and the debate that's there is probably pretty important in terms of what is the role that nuclear uh, can play in the energy transition? Because <clears throat> if you're talking about the energy sector right now, and any kind of debate, no matter what part of the energy sector, you're, you're only talking about the energy transition. And I mean, that's kind of rightly so, because the energy transition touches on everything anyway, right? Um, yeah, so what nuclear advocates want to talk about in terms of where nuclear power can have a role is that one, nuclear doesn't suffer from the intermittency dilemma that wind and solar has, which is just that you don't always know how much power they're going to produce, right? So, so you, you can have times of plentiful energy from some solar and wind farms, which might even be too much for the grid. So you have to make sure that you have enough grid capacity for resilience in that sense, and maybe to transport the extra somewhere else. Uh, and then, of course, there's times when you don't have much wind or much solar or, or much sunlight. Uh, and so you have to have storage in place. And what the nuclear advocates say is, OK, storage is great, but also you can also have excess. You can also have generation capacity, like central generation capacity. It's very reliable that they could be sent to different places, right? Um, which is a valid point. Um, <clears throat> the other kind of thing. Uh, that, that they talk about a little bit, and this is a bit more flavor of the month almost, or, or at least trying to catch on to a new trend, is they talk about the potential role of nuclear generation in electrolysis to create green hydrogen. Um, and these these sound good, but they, there's there's definitely some problems with uh, with the question as well. But, but again, like public debate, eh. uh, industry debate, sure. I, I would say that there's more of that. Thank you very much. You gave us some really interesting um, comments on the three questions. And um, this is the end of this podcast. I'd like to continue in the past, if you don't mind. And I'll be happy to um, invite you. I hope you 
would accept another invitation but this is for this is the end for now and uh, mm -hmm. thank you very much for joining us today um, and yeah we'll stay in touch thank you great it, thanks for having me Lisa. it was again always a pleasure my pleasure thank you